Hello together. We start with our third or fourth reading on big data and language technologies. Um, I will, what you will see today, what you can expect, um, it, there will be a very short recap from what we had last week and also a deepening of softmax, but not too much. And then we go over to deep learning networks in specifically in specific things we will treat um, recurrent neural networks today. Okay, um, I would like to say hello and also explain why I do this short recap each time. I expect from myself, from my mindset to explain things from the very first principles. That means if, if I ask a person to explain something, I don't want to get a number of buzzwords. I want to explain it from that place on where I can follow. And these are basic mathematic axioms how you learned that in school. And hence, um, I will, reca will recap this so that you can explain the whole story. From an advanced student or PhD student, I expect this also that he can, for each topic where he's talking about, can go down to the first axioms. And what does this mean here? Um, we started very simple. We have points. You see this? And um, I guess that you understand these, what regression here means. We can fit a line. We then learned that we can also use regression to master classification. Classification are also points in, in the real plane, but with very few values. And then we can do this in higher dimensions, like you see here. And regression in higher dimensions then um, will put there a plane. <clears throat> Okay. Um, the program seems to be crashed or it's not properly set up to pointing. Yannick, you might notice how to get back into the pointing mode. Click on the right. Not possible. Sorry for this. Okay, I hope now it's better. Yeah. Okay. And so let me do regression. Here we are again. It looks like this. We then learned improvement of this, namely the logistic model function. And if we use this for regression, it will improve from here to that. This, uh, there are several reasons which I don't repeat today, but you know them already. The algorithm to do this is not too complicated. It has four major steps. It evaluates the function. It calculates the error. It calculates the derivative of the error and then updates the weights. <clears throat> the method for weight update is gradient descent. Also went into this last week. What you see here, the green plane is an error plane. This is a plane that you compute. You compute the gradient of the model function minus the target function. And this gives exactly this plane here. And the idea is to go down to this cross here, and you are somewhere here with a certain setting of your model function. And this certain setting is characterized by a weight vector. And you change the weight vector in such a way that the error becomes minimal. For linear regression, this um, is this model function, and this is a derivative. More precisely, it's called gradient. It's a derivative in p dimensions.
for the zero one loss. That means if you compute this here, we get this arrow plane here and you see it's not differentiable. And we cannot use it to guide our optimization process. And for logistic regression, I didn't show you this last time. It looks like this. It's superior this here in various respects, but I don't discuss this for the moment. We then learned neural networks to know. We use neural networks to get stronger functions here in our model function place. So biological inspiration is clear, but I show you this only to not compare our, math our mathematics to our brain. We use something like this. In fact, you saw it already. This is called the perceptron of Rosenblatt. And um, this can compute a few things. It has the input linearly weighted and has a step function here. The problem with this Rosenblatt perceptron is that we can only decide linear separable sets. That means sets, classes, here are two classes, A and B, sets between, we can draw a line or a hyperplane in higher dimensions without doing any wrong classification. In fact, what we need here, if sets are not linearly separable, we need such a combination of planes. I introduced the principle of this, and this is more than a principle because exactly this way it's applied only in larger scale. Instead of a single perceptron, we have several. In each of these perceptrons brings us such a line. And with the last perceptron, we combine this line. And in fact, we are here, you see it, it's a, a pink color or violet color in the so-called feature space. The decision is now done here, not anymore here. The only problem with this is how to find weights such that the lines do exactly that what we want to. And uh, this brings us to the so-called logistic or sigmoid function, which we use instead of the step function here, here. And this uh, overviewed slide shows you what you get if you apply different activation functions. With a linear activation function, you cannot get more power. The combination of this here corresponds to a single perceptron. The combination of this here is not differentiable. And the combination of this here instead works. The algorithm to compute the derivative is called backpropagation. Here we see such a network again. Forward propagation is computing this value. You get your x here. It is put in here. It is multiplied with the weight matrix here. Here's the activation function applied. It's multiplied with the weight matrix here. Activation function applied. The output is there. Back propagation now takes the loss. That means here, the difference of the output and the ground truth, computes the derivative, and changes the weights. This leads us to this scheme. And this looks pretty much like the scheme before, only the computation of the derivatives becomes now more complicated if our network becomes bigger. Here 
here is the computation. And here's a, a small hint for you. I've marked this operation here yellow because you might see a certain operator there. It's a so-called dyadic product or tensor product. And this is formed, it's explained on the uh, links here or on the web pages or in, in the slides. Um, it is um, the name that gave tools like TensorFlow, um, in fact, its name. We propagate or let the tensor X or this operation, which again becomes a tensor flow through the network. This is the reason why it's called TensorFlow. And one remark on ten tensors altogether, um, sometimes you, you learn that tensors are matrices. This is true, but not every matrix is a tensor. A tensor is always a result of this operation of a dyadic product. Don't think if you see um, a two-dimensional matrix is a rank one tensor, or if you see a cube, it's a rank two tensor. This is uh, most in most of the cases wrong. Okay. Tensors have certain properties, but we don't need them here. In fact, this is nice that we see that there are so many tensor products, but uh, I think that's all that we need from tensors at the moment. If you go to arbitrary depths, here you see arbitrary layers that can be stacked. The propagation is still canonically, but uh, becomes larger. You see this here, the nested computation is deeper. The back propagation leads us to the same algorithm scheme as before, but the scheme is more complicated. And again, you see the tensor product here. What we then learned, this uh, closed the last uh, reading, was a softmax function. You see the softmax function here. It's stacked at the end of such a network. And what is it does? It does exactly the same what I was sigmoid function does for two classes, but the softmax function does this for k classes. Each component of the softmax operator, each dimension looks like this. And with this softmax operation, we get the two axioms of the three axioms of Kolmogorov, namely the positivity and the unitarity. And this again means what we get here is a distribution about our guesses about the class output. Let's say we have k classes between we have to decide. Then our algorithm with the softmax function gives us a probability distribution and says this class here is most likely. This is quite unlikely. And we have the probability values to uh, see the exact quantification. And we compare this distribution then to the ground truth distribution, which is for every class zero except this one here. And the difference between this ground truth distribution and our distribution, this is measured as a cross entropy loss. The cost entropy loss is something you already learned to know in two dimensions. That's the loss function of the sigmoid classifier. And the cost entropy loss, in fact, tells us how expensive is the expression of information if we use a certain distribution or uh, Q compared to a distribution or probability measure P. And if P is the ground truth, and if Q is our computed distribution, we can ask how close are we to P in that sense that we quantify how expensive is the expression of our result when we use the distribution P. This cross-entropy 
has a number of advantages which uh, go back to mathematical special um, uh, characteristics of this function, which um, I don't explain at the moment here, but which are not too difficult to understand. I've linked a few places um, in the slides where you can uh, see more information if you're interested. What I've prepared for you and I didn't show last time is a derivation which helps you to read other papers from the cross entropy in different writings. Normally you see this formalization, this definition, the cross entropy H between two distributions P and Q is then here's the sum about all possible classes, the probability for a certain class under P times the probability taking the log for the class under Q. And sometimes you have not this syntax, but that syntax here, which uses probability functions instead of probability measures. And uh, this, they are equivalent in that sense that these functions, I give you these backgrounds for reading purposes, this um, probability measure written with random variable C defines exactly this function. And if you then go for, uh, take this uh, way of writing and go for two classes, you see this here, and this exactly is what we already used in logistic regression. You see that everything comes together and nothing should be really new. And I hope that I can show you the connecting points. And if you go from two classes to K classes, <clears throat> then we are there. Namely this formula, which you see here, is exactly used here. I changed the notation a little bit from last week to make it um, easier to learn. The sigmoid function is a sigma and uh, the cross entropy function is a sigma one because it is a sigmoid function unified so that it uh, fulfills the axioms two of and one of Kolmogorov but uh, the computation is pretty similar to the sigmoid function. You find in the literature, at some places only the sigma, at some places you find the word sigmoid or softmax, but uh, this is a very good notation here. And um, another thing on notation, if I write it in bold letters, you have already, I guess, recognized this. Um, we have a vectorial output and if it's not bold, like here, we have a scalar output. Okay, this um, is a recap, a bit more of the recap. And uh, we now uh, go over to the next part. And this is um, the introduction to deep learning, already this was deep learning, the last two readings, but um, it's now a bit more classic here. Is still readable? Okay. Yeah, um, I'm happy to announce, but I want to repeat that deep learning is not a particular method. It's also not a new technology. It's a term which it's a sales person's term. It's a buzzword and it, everybody might understand something different among this. And um, what is fair, this is how Goodfellow, Benjo and Corville do this. They see it as a kind of umbrella term. They, they found already that uh, the, the roots, uh, the Kubernetes roots and the connectionism roots have to do a lot to do with deep learning. And um, I have delineated the history, um, which you have learned also already from um, myself in this reading a bit. 
And um, this started with cybernetics, then the parallel distributed computing, so-called connectionism, and then the age of deep learning. And um, what we didn't discuss in detail uh, from Hinton, it's inven his inventions with regard to autoencoding and autoencoding learning, which is a very important building block in deep learning, which is from 1986. We have already seen the backpropagation algorithm, which is important building block. And this is a theory on attention, namely to introduce shortcuts into a network that suffers under vanishing gradient descent, which will come the next reading. Ah, apropos next reading, next week on Monday is no reading. There are exercises. I don't know whether you start earlier or not. Probably not. I think we stay the best in the rhythm. But I will uh, don't. Uh, I'm not uh, available here uh, to give a lecture lecture next week. We should also write this on the web page. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. A few further hints on deep learning. Mm, Two thousand six. Layer-wise pre-training is a very great idea, which can help us to quicker learn on new situations. In fact, also theory came out of this, not only trial and error, the importance of that. And uh, probably the most um, important uh, change or invention for us in natural language processing, the transformer network architecture. The main idea of the transformer network architecture is that okay? Yes. The main idea is to introduce um, self-attention, which finally, um, with a certain modification of the input data, uh, um, enables us for parallel training which is an enormous factor with regard to performance. And uh, we will learn this in the next but one week. Here, this is also from Goodfellow, Benjo, and Corville, an overview how you should look onto uh, deep learning. It's a part of artificial intelligence and it cannot replace artificial intelligence. This, this uh, picture is to be taken serious. AI is a lot, lot more. And especially it's knowledge modeling rules, calculus, and um, this uh, logical processing and propositional uh, logics, but also probability theory and, and, and. And uh, it can al also not replace and cover all in machine learning. Also, this is wrong here. Think about um, uh, regression trees, think about trees, uh, decision trees and decision forests at all. And it does also not do the representation learning thing like autoencoder does. Deep learning, like a good fellow Benjo and Kerr will see it, as those people might see differently, is in first place the handling of, uh, of deep layered networks, which can be processed in a forward manner, forward computation to compute a certain value, and for which we have complicated backpropagation algorithms to uh, find the optimum, the minimum um, in the error and the optimum of the weights. Mm. Probably the easiest way to think of deep learning is the improvement in task solution quality. We got improvement in computing power. For instance, uh, the very famous graphic cards in VIA 100, we use dozens of them, I guess also in Leipzig there are clusters with them. The memory per device grew extremely and um, the number of network param parameters, which is um, perhaps the most salient observation, went from a few thousands, which were a lot that time, to billion in GPT-3. 
The question is whether this makes sense at all. And many years, scientists. And did not believe in this idea to blowing this up to this number. But the success in solving tasks gives the practitioners right. Yes, it, it, it seems to work. And this is not so easy to explain because there is still the curse of dimensionality under which these networks should suffer, but they don't. Of course, we can develop complicated explanations, but this, this big number of parameters makes sense is from my point of view, not the final story. Anyway, for the moment, it's simply the best. We see this, for instance, also the fantastic speech recognition, yeah, which uh, were on the level of dragging dictate at the time when I was at Berkeley, which has now a quality which is unprecedented. Yes. The things simply work. And uh, with translation, you also know it, even native language speakers say that DeepL can bring elements which, from which they can learn. All with this big number of parameters. And if people talk about deep learning, they think about these things. Anyway, I hope you can now differentiate this already and see it more in a more mathematical way and not so uh, hype way. Wise, yeah, let's say it this way. Back to our learning tasks. We can do with deep learning networks nearly everything. Um, I've mentioned here the most important mappings from vector to class. That means we get an email and classify it at spam or hem. From matrix to class, we get an image and classify this. This is a very big and important application of deep learning or from vector to vector, uh, which we do if we want to learn a certain very effective representation like um, autoencoding. Embedding is a magic word for a lot of things which happen. And if the machine learner don't know what to do, they simply embed the data and hope that with embedding the things become easier. I hope that you learn enough and understand enough to not do only this kind of trial and error. From these three basic types, I've separated um, S1, S2, S3, which you see here. I've separated them because they deal with sequences. And um, these are for us in Weimar, but also in Leipzig, from the natural language perspective, the most interesting deep learning experiences. Of course, we also have to solve uh, this here in certain projects, but our main competence is in these three tasks. We get a sequence and want not only to take a fixed document, a static document, but we want to argue about the development when we classify this. Or we get a certain class and want to develop a sentence. For instance, um, think about this, um, language on speech synthesis in, in, in sport commenting. You see something on the field which is analyzed, which image classification, which gives us a certain happening. For instance, something happened in a soccer game. And then we want to have a sequence, a sentence automatically generated. And um, this is quite self explaining. Sentence to sentence is a translation or here English sentence to German sentence is the example, but this can also be paraphrasing or summarization, uh, summarization or making a complicated English sentence to a simple English sentence and so on. Perhaps this here is the most important and universal thing. Solving these tasks means to develop this mapping here. And this mapping is a network. I start, but only very short, because it is not in the center of this course, with convolutional neural networks. I know that Niklas is among us. He has worked much more on this than our groups, 
probably you might enter if you want to. Um, it's not uh, too long here, but only that you see the basic difference between convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks where we spend more time. Let's say we have a classification task, a very simple thing. We have here nine uh, images and these images show numbers and the idea is to, to learn uh, the true number behind this. Of course, the, today's systems can much, much more, but the principle is the same. Yeah, we take here this number. This number then is um, somehow projected onto a matrix. You see this here, somehow processed, and then we get out the result. Very famous cartoon aside, we should be more specific here, and you should be more specific to understand this. You should explain this. I will be a bit more specific here now. You see, I go from here to here, and I consider our image as an input matrix. And this input matrix is treated somehow, and I treat it in a very standard way. This, uh, what you see here, this projection is a filter operation, which can you understand? It's also in the remarks written as a multiplication with a Hamada product with a certain weight matrix. And for instance, these nine pixels here are comprised and weighted into this single pixel here. This is a filter now with nine weights. And uh, this um, is uh, this orange area here is a moving window which moves over the input and it produces a lot of these filtered outputs, very simple. What we then can do is we can collect all these results here. The arrow here should demonstrate this, it's a kind of flatten operation, flattening operation. And we can then take this vector and do that what we always did by now, we feed it into a multi-layer perceptron. This here has a single hidden layer. And um, I explain this directly in mathematical terms because normally you see in these videos or in these lectures or in these blogs on the, these fancy figures, and this does not help me from a mathematical standpoint. What helps me is the following. There is this vector here. This is this vector, y um, with a superscript c. And this vector is processed by the neural network with a hidden matrix, the activation function, the output matrix, and then we have an activation function. This can also be the softmax function. And the input, which you see here, is simply processed by this whole Y. And you can make this now more complicated. You can operate many such filters. You can do a lot of things with these filters. I have mentioned a few examples in the remarks. What we in fact do here is we learn a representation. And uh, sometimes you have seen these famous articles where this is done for image recognition of faces or other things. And then elements of building blocks of faces or cars, animals are represented in different different depths in different layers. And then the people say this layer identifies the eyes, this layer identifies the lips and so on and so on. What I want you to, to learn to understand is that the input is more or less a matrix, which then is convoluted 
Convolution means in German Faltung, folding. Yeah, this is a convolution operation. This is a terminus technicus and image representation. It's, it has to do with a mathematical op convolution operator, but not directly. It's a discrete convolution. That's a Venus or cosine discrete convolution. Um, but you should not be too nervous for it, uh, because of this work. And after this um, layers of convolution, we flatten this image here and this vector, this output vector, and then process it classically with a multi-layer preset. Um, we can now use such a network to do interesting things. Of course, we can learn to classify. And the way we do this, and this is something I would like to outline here shortly. Although we do not deepen convolutional network, we should at least have heard about this. We can do this learning in a decoupled way and in a combined way. And this is um, interesting for us because decoupled means that we do the discrimination step here independent of the representation step where, for instance, we learn a very strong embedding here but we keep the learning of the embedding separated from the learning of the classification. But if you have real big data, we can exploit this error which we get here with the classical error computation and backpropagation. We can exploit this error which we compute here and even improve the representation. This is a combined way. Learn the filter weights of a representation along with the weights of the classifier. It is from the learning technology will learn, uh, lead us to the stronger classifier, but it requires that we have sufficient ground truth data, labeled examples. And I have told you in lessons before that this labeling is most of one of the most important aspects in machine learning. The decoupled approach leads us to embeddings which already work and can be re reused. For instance, if you learned a certain kind of animals, we might use this knowledge to learn another kind of animals with much as examples. This leads us to the ideas of few short learning and one short learning. <clears throat> okay, this is quite interesting, but not deepened here too much. Um, here are a few extensions to what I told you. I would take the chance to show you the state of the art, one of the best performing CNNs for image classification, it has more than 100 layers and more than hundreds of millions of parameters. And you can directly look at the results. If you click on this page, which now is gone, Sorry, so. And here you can see the state of the art, the best performing um, networks are shown here. You see here the developers or the names of the networks. You see here the accuracy you see it's about 90%, but on which data set? Yes, on extreme data set. But before I show you this, um, show that you also can look at other accuracy ideas, namely um, top one versus top five accuracy is the class, class among the um, top five. That means is your guess among the top five 
is among your top five the correct guess or top one accuracy, which is of course more interesting you know, that you directly guess um, the true image. The data set is um, from ImageNet, about 14 million images are here. This data set is, consists of various sub data sets. And uh, we have seen before here, um, the performance was on the classic um, image um, net data set, and it was from the COCA model. Okay, go back from back here and leave this here. Um, what you, you, you can play around here and also uh, compare different solutions. Um, I will leave it for you as a pointer for the moment and we continue in the reading. It is, um, here you see it here under papers with code, classification of ImageNet on ImageNet. Okay. We come to recurrent neural networks. Um, I could now demonstrate architectures of recurrent neural networks, but what I found most difficult in recurrent neural networks was to understand the recurrency, how this mechanism works. And hence we, Michael Felsk and me have spent some time to illustrate what in fact happens. Um, because the networks are not too complicated, but how they work, this is quite intricate. And uh, we want you to get the grip on this, basically. Um, don't be afraid. This is an abstraction of something. This is only for notation purposes. We will come to this later. And we, I will introduce you stepwise. Um, you see here, but only to show you, to give a smart thing of orientation, we have an encode and decoder and a lot of colors. Don't worry about this. I bring this slide because for you to go back to this, to understand that we have a certain color coding. We have input colors. The colors do not change. Um, we, we use them already in the um, multi-layer perceptron. We, we um, made this conf conformant, but uh, so you might have not this always in your mind, and then you can check this here. The input is gray. This is what we, for sentence, which we want to classify, for instance, hidden layers are violet. There are also hidden letters, which we where we give certain information, normally a, a number of zeros. Attention layers will today not play a role. The output layer is blue, was it before also, and um, if we have a target, which we want to reach, we have a mixture between this uh, gray and this blue. And we are able to distinguish between the training situation and the test uh, situation. This means um, we have uh, the output the class at some time, for instance, and our compute class, our idea. And if we have both at certain time points, you see this mixture of this hashed blue gray and this solid blue gray, and the solid uh, blue. Okay, this is only for you. This slide is there. You can go to it later on. A few things which I have explained are also on the remarks. There's also, also other things which I haven't explained. And I will start with a certain task where we are giving a sequence, a sentence, for instance, and want to classify this. And we use very simple examples so that we hopefully can follow here. The sentence is, I love my cat, is an example. And this has a positive sentiment, and I want to learn this. You see, this is a slide from before. Solving this task means to compute to develop this thing here, this model function.
what you know by now is this here. This is a, a multi-layer perceptron, or this one this is a, this is a one hidden layer. And you enter some vector x. This is stationary, not a sequence. This is only one x. And for this x, you compute this y. You see the colors, we used them already the weeks before. And here I repeat also the indices we have used always through all our, our 5,000 uh, machine learning slides, the same indices, p-dimensional input, k-dimensional output, up to d-active layers. Now we have a sequence. That means instead of one vector, we have, for instance, t vectors. Yes. So we have different time points, time point one, two, three, four, up to capital T. And what a recurrent neural network does, it feeds one after the other of these input vectors to the single hidden layer. Um, and we have different hidden layers. Now we have one hidden layer, but at different points in time. And this is usually depicted as a network. But in fact, it is one array, also memory. That means this, what you see here, here happens something, here in this processing happens something. This is usually enrolled. The hidden matrix, which you see here, is always the same. And the hidden vector is always the same, but at different time points. And we feed one time point after the other year in. And um, for initialization purposes, but only for this, so that you get also an idea why we need these hashed elements, we start with a zero vector. So that this first computation here can be done. I think also from this, we cannot see a lot. And hence, we will bring you now a short animation of what happens. At time point zero, we enter the first element of the matrix, the first column, this here. And we have no hidden vector by now, and we use random zeros vector. With these two vectors, we compute with a randomized matrix at the beginning, some output vector. We add to this output vector a constant one and bring it to the next input time step. And then we take our second vector x. You see, and this is very nice here, this is only one matrix we are working on. Now the matrix has undergone one operation, namely the operation at time point zero, with the random vector yh and the true input x1. Now we are at x2. The same thing happens again. And we get an updated hidden vector and would take a new x, but I now show how this works in our unfolded layered version. We start with a random here and the true input here. Compute this part. This is the first hidden vector without the one at the one and take the second input vector. 
In this way, we move forward. And hence we see always these images. But in fact, I go back, it's only this. This is something we want you to understand because later on when we use attention or other shortcuts, it, 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 it should not simply become complicated and complicated. No, you should exactly know why do they need attention here? What happens? And now you see what happens. And now you also will understand that with each time step, we get new input, but the information from the time steps before is, uh, goes uh, farther to the background. Yeah, that's a question. Um, but this also means that we need multiple examples at one time point, right? Here, um, um, the question was um, uh, whether we need mo multiple examples at uh, one time point. Um, what you saw here is... Part of an example. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. I will show. What you saw here was the, um, the, the processing of one matrix, one sentence. Each column characterizes a word. Yeah? We, will, we will see this later even more in detail. Mm -hmm. And one matrix is one example. And of course, we have thousands of matrices now. Yeah? And this answers your question. Yeah? Yeah. The matrix is one example. It should not be understood as a training set. No, it is one example of the training set. But we are training a sequence now. And uh, I see this question is very, very good and very important. It shows this is necessary to understand what happens. Yeah? The APIs that you use hide all this for you. Of course, you can say it is nice that they hide this. Okay, this is nice. In fact, if you have understood this, this is nice. If you're not understood this, it's not nice. Okay. Um, I work through an example. Mm, we have a database. This is our set D. As before, we have a vocabulary. This vocabulary is developed by going through all words here and list them. We form now an input, very simple. It's a kind of back of word models without weights. And I love my cat has four words and hence has four input vectors. And each input vector has a certain one. You can call it hot encoded, but it's not usual to say this is hot encoded. This is rather used in other places, this word. This are... Uh, um, Back of word models, and each vector characterizes a position in the vocabulary. In fact, you recall the very first session when, when Lucas, the very first reading, demonstrated a learning with a Python example where he took movie reviews. And they were all similarly encoded, but then he did not uh, an embedding beforehand. We don't do this here. We make it complicated is not so a problem. I would like to show you basically that we did nothing different than we do here now. The embedding step is missing. The output is what we compute. The target is what we want to have. And between these two, you compute the cross entropy. This is a network from before. The output 
is here. The output is a result of taking this matrix times this hidden vector. We apply the sigmoid function or the um, softmax function and get this blue vector. The intermediate hidden vectors are these here, which you see they are highlighted. They are computed for all time steps, like I demonstrated you before. And they are computed completely canonically. This here now is fixed. These are not different matrices. This matrix takes the hidden vector from the step before and the current input. Hence, we have this diagonal. And of course, our init vector with zeros. That's all. And this means that you can program your own deep learning network very easily with this. Backpropagation, derivative, derivative computation, everything is like before. Nothing ma magic in between. I bring you the exact example here. We have four hidden vectors. We input, I love my cat. Exactly these vectors, which I showed you before. We compute some result and compare it to the ground truth. Yeah, that's... Um, the first um, task I demonstrated to you how it is done with an RNN. And um, probably it's um, time for asking for questions, if there are questions. Uh, Niklas, Lukas, you can also, or Martin, I don't know, I haven't seen you by now. You can also comment on this or also ask questions. I think there is a question in the Zoom chat. Mm -hmm. Arthur asks if this also how it's done in TensorFlow at low level. Uh, sorry, the question, uh, could you repeat again, Lucas? Is this? Is this also how it's done in TensorFlow at low level? Yeah, also you know it a bit better also, um, Yannick, but I will directly say yes, it is uh, done at low level in TensorFlow this way. However, of course, and there was a lot of mathematics and improvements um, with regard to learning and uh, other things, um, optimization, stability, robustness, um, regularization, performance. If you do these dirty things aside, yes, this is how it's done. Niklas, you can also comment on this, of course. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I would totally agree with this but, i mean in the inner details you could of course rearrange things um but yeah in the end this is how it's done okay let's see whether we have some questions here but yes so if then there is a vector which encodes the word not for we are thrown to that then it would have like it would be very important or not for the final class um, Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me re re repeat the question. Maybe so. The question was: um, If you have the word "not" for negation, how is that encoded, right? And uh, because this word is very important for the classification result, this was the ah, question. Yeah, very good question. Um, in fact, it's uh, not encoded differently. We will later learn that um, the networks, especially with attention can better react on these things. What we need is a proper reaction on a sequence. 
but the basic mechanism still is the same. And uh, hence, this is also what you learned or experienced with the very first examples four weeks ago. It did not so work so well. And this means uh, there were, there were we, we, we applied this uh, sentiment classifier. It was a very simple one. This is clear. But uh, you cannot learn the word not from, from, from 100 examples with a, simple, with a little bit training. Mm -hmm. It is in that fact so difficult. And you do not encode a special not vector in the, in the network. What in fact happens, especially if um, attention vectors, these are vectors which introduce shortcuts or simplify things, uh, uh, may happen is that vectors react uh, sensible and, uh, on, on, on certain sentences. This can happen. But um, there is no trick to learn uh, this uh, logical negation. And this is good that you ask this, because there is no not solution. Yeah? And uh, you would directly learn it. If, if you have a solution for not, I would say I come with double negation, and then your not solution is gone, yeah? or with triple negation. And this is, it is not so easy. Okay, further questions, uh, Nicholas? Probably not. There is one in the chat, but it's very long, so give me just a second to read it, to then recite it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Let's. Uh, we, it's good um, to some time because it, for me it took time to understand recurrency. If you take it so easy, you're welcome. My compliment. Uh, the the question in the chat is that there's a new approach called capsule neural networks from Hinton et al. Um, for image classification, and the question is if these are still regarded as neural networks. Um, and why are they not yet used by a majority? I'm not familiar with the with capsule networks, but if someone asks us, maybe they can answer that. Um, I'm also not familiar with this, but um, I see every month new papers coming, and uh, with some of them I'm familiar with, others not, and. Um, to, to, to state a, um, a general, generic form of you know, lunch, free lunch theorem, um, I do not expect a, um, a one um, a silver bullet for, to, for, for complicated things. I, I expect improvements and uh, I expect no one size fits all solution. And this again means, and uh, this is what I uh, want to say is we have at heart to understand the basic um, dyadic or tensor operations which happen over time sequences here. Um, in the next level of complexity, and this is, um, you should take one by one, otherwise you, I think we cannot understand this, at least I cannot understand this. The next level of complexity, which will be uh, uh, not uh, um, um, teach to talk today, um, is getting away from the sequence idea by adding to each element of the sequence a certain kind of a signal and by adding these all and letting the signal re-extract the order again later. This leads us to transformers. This is very complicated this idea. And if we use this idea, we have the next layer. And if we have understood this, we might take the next step. And it means uh, this is a paper which you mentioned, or could be the paper which you mentioned. This means um, even if there are such papers, I, if you want to get a grip on these things, you should take this development step by step as they were done. And even if they are not visible anymore in the transformer networks, what I show you here, in hard they are compiled in. That means the characteristics of this network is somehow, uh, comes somehow from these RNN like you see it here. Um, 
If I did it understand correctly, we updated our weights after each word, didn't we? Yeah. Um, how would a batched like structure look like? Because in batched mode, we, yeah. Ah, we have to we have to make all sentences the same length. Also, this was done in the example uh, with um, uh, with Lucas presented to you. Yeah. You well, see. Single example actions. Okay. But then the, the um, bag of words idea would not fit in there. Of course, it must fit. And you will find a universal encoding. So this is done. And this is done in transformer. Okay. That means that, that, that for this reason, I, I, I find it so important to understand what is happening because you cannot escape these problems. <laughs> The sentence, uh, the, the question with the length is absolutely correct. We have to make all examples of the same length. We have to think about words we, we have never seen, which can be solved by going onto the um, character level. Yeah, or um, they do it much smarter. They take uh, two bytes and combine them. This is uh, really smart, but. Um, this becomes clear if, if you go these steps which we propose you to go. Again, uh, this goes to Niklas and, uh, of course, Yannick and uh, Lukas and Martin. Um, it is the view of Michael and me to, to understand this from the first principles. If you, have, I, if you do not um, go with this or if you do, would contradict, it's okay to, to discuss other views. Yeah? Um, following up on the previous question about uh, length, obviously the sentences here are not the same length. So if you have a recurrence that would encode the last sentence, what happens to the first four? Um, this is only omitted here that they are not of the same length. They have to mate to the same length. Okay, so if, if my shortest sentence is four words, all other sentences must be short. Mm, or um, if my longest sentence is uh, eight words, all sentences must have eight words. Have the sequence, or you can uh, do single sentence batches, similar to batches. We need to repeat this. We didn't get that. Yeah, okay, could, could you could you repeat this? Uh, probably closer to the microphone. Yeah. Uh, is this yeah. better okay. to understand here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. You, okay. you, you can either pass the shorter sequences to a longer length, or you can uh, do single batch, single example batches where you vary the length between batches. But I did do, do not demonstrate this the, the, the letters uh, the letter version. Yeah? Probably we will um, extend the slides in this regard so that we um, illustrate this also. Yeah, Martin, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, it would make sense. I, I mean, it's good that the length question came up because at some point people will run into it. People usually also think of recursion as something that just runs until the recursion is over instead of having to predefine a recursion at a certain depth. Of course, uh, I see that in order for the um, actual code to be um, uh, created inside TensorFlow or other libraries, uh, there needs to be some limits. Exactly. And in fact, in fact, if you use TensorFlow, you will notice that immediately, that even though in theory you have uh, variable length, uh, you will have to cut everything into a fixed size matrix. Mm. Yeah, it is. Um, I also was struggling with the word, you, you mentioned it, recursion. For good reasons, it's called recurrent. <laughs> Not the question whether it is in fact recursion in that sense, because we, um, we do repeat, we re reoccur, but we uh, have no recursion anchor in that sense. We have Mm -hmm. 
Sorry, what? Vanishing gradients. Uh, yeah, vanishing gradients. But vanishing gradient is not treated now. It is treated um, uh, later. Um, in the next but one week. This is... Um, <laughs> Is in fact, uh, yeah, it's, it's in, on our list. But there's another question in the chat. Um, if besides the training length and like the, these time increasing, are there any major disadvantages if we increase the sequence length of T? Um, this goes to practitioners. Um, you mentioned this already. Yannick, can you again repeat some things? Of course, the vanishing gradient problem becomes bigger if you have to propagate um, error back. Um, it, uh, the impact of the error on the weights becomes smaller the closer you get to the beginning of the network. This is a problem which uh, is to be addressed with um, LSTM networks or today with um, how are they called? I forgot it. Um, act, uh, act attention uh, with, with attention uh, vectors. So a long sequence is, uh, is actually what LSTMs were meant to solve in some sense, but uh, they're still very restricted in the sequence length they can actually remember. Mm -hmm. I still struggle a bit, um, uh, and I suppose others do too, with the fact that all sentences have to be the same length, because um, uh, the fact that we have to sh uh, cut down longer ones, I, I know, I knew, of course, and uh, it is always, uh, this is why I mentioned it earlier also, but um, uh, in, in uh, Lucas' uh, presentation, but... Um, so the, we lose information there, but the shorter sentences, we, we cannot make a shorter sentence longer. There's no point in that, so we have to lose we it. Can, we can no? embed them. No, no, this is not true. We can embed them. We can embed, or we can just simply pad them with zeros, for example. Yes, yes. So you would less pad them with, with zeros. But, uh, but embedding is also a valid strategy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, so in the end, there is there is uh, uh, there is a token in these sentences that tells us the sentence is over. It's the dot, and I suppose it's also there uh, or should be at some point. And of course, the rest can be passed through yeah, so after that until the recurrence the end. In a tensorflow, it's called a mask, where you have a zero mask which um, is overlaid on the matrix and. Uh, says, okay, this is this is the sentence length and everything that comes after or before it is actually not part of the sentence. Okay. Should I continue? Uh, no questions from us anymore, so yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Um, we use now the, the same machine, machinery to deal with another problem, the problem class to sequence. We, we start with some token or class label, a plus or a minus in our case, and we want to produce a sentence, for instance, a positive sentiment label, and then I want to produce the sentence, I love my cat. And here, this means that we have, um, this is opposed to before, we have not a sequence input, but a sequence output. That means we have to uh, decode something in the network into a series of output vectors. And hence, this is also called decoder. And um, as before, I will illustrate this decoding step. And um, without context, you see here some vector yo, one hidden vector, a time point zero, and some matrix. These here are random values at the beginning. 
this here is the desired output or the produced output as you like it. They are used to compute or update a hidden vector, which then is the basis for the next output, which has to be first generated, which happens here, and which then is reused here. This mixed color here shows you, here, uh, sorry, shows you that in the training phase, you have the ground truth here. And in the production phase or in the test phase, when you apply the network, you have your own output. Because if you produce a sequence, your output at time t also depends on your previously generated output at time 10 minus 1. This is repeated and looks in the network like follows. This might help here. In the unfolded hidden layers view, you see we start with a so-called start token, a random zero vector. We compute the first hidden vector, the hidden vector at t is one. And we use this vector to compute this output here. Which then is used to manipulate or update the hidden vector. Which then gives the next output. This is perhaps not so easy to understand. We now train this matrix and this here. This is the entire RNN sequence decoding. Our output that we are interested in is this here. This is a so-called start token, which we know about always, which we enter. And this is the end token, which we have to produce because we do not know this time, in fact. The end token is in the examples, of course, if you learn it. But at test time, at production time, we have to produce it ourselves. Why the start token can always be given, because we say we now want to start to output something. I will apply this example what we had again. We have these sentences. Now you see our independent variable is the sentiment, and our dependent variable is the sentence to be produced. Of course, the, uh, the um, uh, dimension, uh, dimensions of freedom are a bit higher in these examples, but this does not play a role from the principal way. We have the vocabulary as before, and we add a certain start and a stop token.
we have an input. And we produce an output from which we know the first vector. This is namely the star token. And a number of other outputs from which the last one has to be the stop token. But we don't know it. Our target is given here. And the example is quite close with these points, which you see here with the vector to the vocabulary, vocabulary, which you see above. I have highlighted the start and stop tokens, which you know at training and at production time. Again, you train with the example this plus this, and you shall produce this here. And you will recognize that you come to an end if you produce this stop token. And the problem is, this has to be learned by the recurrent neural network. All outputs that you generate are here. For a sequence of the length capital T, these are T. This here is start. All inner states, all hidden vectors are here. And the matrix which we've trained is here. In training time and in test time, I repeat myself, here's a start token. You see this with it. Evil sign. In training time, here's also the stop token. This is the first initial vector, typically a zero vector. And here's the example. And the coloring is, and here you now understand why I have this uh, color notation at the beginning. The input and the output from the examples is always green. A light green for the input and a dark green for the desired output. The produced output is in blue and this time I have illustrated a network that exactly is able to produce this, but this is only my wish here or the illustration purpose here. Um, and not much to say about this, except that with this mechanism, you can decode a certain vector. In this case, it's only one signal, one label, into an output. Of course, the case appears a bit artificial because you have this number of degrees in freedom from a single label to an entire sentence. But the mechanism is important now to understand if we plug both things together, the encoding and the decoding. 
And uh, probably this is, this is not enough time, I would say, now to understand everything, but I will show you how we do this technically and how this network would look like. It's not a surprise. It consists of these two networks that you saw before. We come to our third task, sequence to sequence. And as an example, we take a translation job and we take the vocabulary from before and we translate, I love my cat, nach ich liebe meine Katze. I mean, it's, uh, by accident, the same number of words, but uh, this is a difference. I have example sentences from which I can learn. I love my cat, you my cats, it's raining cats and dogs, it's raining in storm, and so on. We have two vocabularies, an encoding vocabulary and a decoding vocabulary. Our input is, I love my cat, encoded as a bag of words model, like before. Our desired output is a target. Start token, stop token, and the correct sentence in between. In the network, this looks like this. Here's the encoding completely done. And decoding starts. Sorry, I should um, this line. Sorry, yes, perhaps it works this way. This line should be like this. With the example, in the exact number of layers, or let's say vector at time points. For inputs, I love my cat. Has to be translated to start. Ich liebe meine Katze. Stop. This is compared. Uh, this, no, this. This is, happens during the training. And if I use the network in production or test mode, I produce this sentence, which usually will not be this perfect sentence. Compared to the desired sentence and to the back propagation that needs the learning. Mm. This already is hard to understand, but we cannot go much deeper. We are very close at the mathematics already. This is a network which we program in machine learning course. And this is a very simple form of what we have in translation machines. And now you understand in, in, or can understand where the research goes in to make this effective. Because also if this is a basic principle to make this to a strong translation, um, it still takes a lot. Yeah, question. Um, I know there's a question in the yeah. chat. Um, how does the decoder know when to produce a stop token? Uh, the decoder does not know. Uh, perhaps you will see this if you work with GPT-3 and you want to create something and it does not create what you want. Hmm. It does not know. Um, the, in fact, when I heard it the first time, 
the idea of prompt engineering that we build a complex machinery which we don't understand and then we try prompts to think to find out how it behaves i found it's very stupid but meanwhile i see it is difficult to get a grip on these machines no we don't know we can only hope that it does it in a good time Of course, there are mechanisms with uh, like attention uh, to mention this in first place, because this uh, would be the next improvement here to learn which words trigger more weights than uh, other words. But there's no, um, as I said before, no silver bullet. Yeah, here's a question. It actually knows when a stop token is possible, does it? Because it don't know. I, I don't know this. I cannot tell you. This, this. No. Why should the question here? The hint was that um, the network would know when a stop token is possible. And the network is a, is a connection of matrices or two matrices. Benno, can you repeat the interjection that didn't reach the mic? Uh, could, could you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, I cannot repeat the question. The question, I, I thought I did repeat this. The question was, that the network has at least an idea when to stop, but I even refrain to say this. But um, Lucas, uh, Martin, Niklas, or uh, Yannick, you, you are working with these networks. I guess what I describe here, or what we describe here, in fact, shows what happens in reality. Yeah, that's what the model has been trying for. Yannick said here in the end, it's what the model is trying it's, for. It's, it's, it doesn't know any better or worse to produce a stop token than any other token. Yeah, stop token is only one of many. In the end, in practice, as far as I know, GPT just is stopping to generate at some point. Uh, or it, 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 is, it is stopped. And yeah, in the end... Uh, yeah, and of course, Martin, yeah. And it's a, uh, I would also say probability raises with this time. But why does it raise? Because I know that the, in, the sequence has to come to an end. And a good strategy is simply to stop at some point. Now it's... Yes. You've told enough. I mean, this is what what uh, many, uh, in the end, uh, in terms of problem solving, doing this could also be done in a basic generate and test manner. You generate a lot of examples exactly. and then you test which one is the best. Again, okay. maybe using some uh, way of deciding which example that is was generated may be the best one. Martin, this is perfect. And this is a way of prompt engineering, how it's in fact done. I mean, there, there, there is nothing special to the stop token that also generates an infinite sequence like you do when you click the next word in your mobile um, keyword. keyboard. Uh, and it just generates the next word and the next word and the next word. And then you will notice that at some point it will start repeating itself. Um, but overall, this is just one of many tokens that the model could generate. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we will, the slides in the new version will be on the internet. And I hope that we could at least at the beginning clarify a lot about RNNs for those who are, were new to this. And um, then I would uh, close it today's reading and we see us again, um, I would say in two weeks from my side. However, next week um, there is uh, An exercise, and we can also start the seminar phase like um, Yannick uh, mailed today. And um, I want to say thank you for all of you, to all of you, uh, for for being here and listening. And um, I'm happy to continue this discussion later on. <laughs>